Uh, I'm going to begin by giving a little historical overview about uh, how the mechanics of the matrix was discovered in our world, in, the, in, in quantum, uh, and how it, in some senses, seems to break the normal rules of reality. And that this is not just a theory, but something which you can really test in the lab and test there for the existence of the matrix, for this hidden uh, level of, of reality. Then I'm going to talk briefly about how we can actually harness these superpowers to do good for the good of mankind, uh, just like the Avengers just down the hall. Um, and, and finally, I want to return to sort of a bit more philosophical about what this t really tells us about the nature of things. What is the nature of the matrix that we've discovered? Okay, so, so you see, this is the beginning of uh, the matrix, the discovery of the mechanics of the matrix, uh, as described in this book here. The formulation of matrix mechanics, you see, I wasn't making it up. Um, <laughs> the physicists here will know that this is a, is it, this is a bit of a joke. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it was around this time, 1925 to 1926, that uh, we started to get a glimpse into uh, how strange the quantum world uh, really was. And so the people, the person, the one person I'd say most responsible for this uh, was a very young at that time German physicist, Werner Heisenberg. Uh, and so he was, there, there was some quantum physics before that time. People knew about atoms and, and that they had energy levels and that they, electrons could jump between them. Uh, and hopefully most of you have, have met this idea before. Uh, but what Heisenberg wanted to, to do is to really understand how this happened. Uh, and so here he is explaining, um, obviously not his real words, but uh, he's saying, so would you believe that by thinking about the emission of light from atoms, this is really what happened, okay, I came up with the idea that a physical quantity like position or velocity should not be represented by a number, but should be represented by a matrix of numbers. In fact, a matrix which can be infinitely large. Okay, so what's a matrix? A matrix is just a square array of numbers like this. So this is an example of a matrix. Uh, in this case, it might be infinitely large because these numbers in, go on to infinity in either direction. And this particular matrix could represent the position of an electron. Okay, seems like a completely crazy idea. What, what does it even mean to say that the position is not a number, but rather is this you know, enormous array of numbers? What could that possibly mean? Well. It, it's still pretty unclear, but the important point that, that for Heisenberg is that using, sorry, using this idea, you know, using this substitution for using a big matrix like this for something, a physical quantity like the position of an electron, it was possible to derive properties of atoms, okay? So not just to assume that atoms had these energy levels and, and, you know, I'll just write down some formula of them and we'll just believe that's the way things are. He could actually derive it all from first principles by making this apparently crazy uh, assumption. So as Heisenberg's saying, uh, some people call this idea matrix mechanics because it was all based on matrices like this, but I prefer, he says, just quantum mechanics. Okay, so the quantum comes from the fact that it leads to what are called quantized energy levels, which just means you have discrete energy levels. So that's the origin of the name, but really at the heart of it was all this stuff with matrices. Okay, so as I said, this seems like a pretty crazy idea, and, and um, you know, physicists, as soon as it came about, they were struggling to understand what did it mean. Uh, and so Heisenberg got together with his uh, slightly older colleague, Niels Bohr, uh, and, and Niels Bohr had an institute in Copenhagen, and so the interpretation they came up with was called the Copenhagen interpretation. Okay? And this there was sort of first set out in 1927. And so here's, here's the explanation about what they, what they think the theory means. Heisenberg saying, the matrix rep representing, for example, the spin of an electron, and the reason I chose that is just because it's actually a much simpler matrix. So here's a, uh, a matrix for the spin of an electron. You don't need to know what spin is, but it's just a nice, very simple matrix. Okay? Does not tell us its value, does not tell us the value of this physical quantity spin. It tells us only the possible values we may find if we measure it. Okay? So they introduce this crucial aspect of measurement for the first time into quantum physics. So in this particular case, the matrix looks like this, uh, 1 half, 0, 1, 1, 0, actually implies that, and you, I'm not saying you should understand this, but this point, just take my word for it, implies that the possible values you could get if you measure this quantity are plus a half or minus a half. Okay, you can derive all this using the theory. 
How's the going on? Okay, before the measurement, the spin has no value. This physical quantity has no value. It is the act of measurement itself which creates the measured value. Okay, this, this was Heisenberg and Bohr's idea. Bohr went even further. In other words, our understanding of reality in the normal, and for physicists we often say macroscopic or classical world, okay, the world we seem to be living in, okay, the, the unhidden world, a normal understanding of that does not apply to the microscopic or quantum world, the world of atoms and, and molecules and electrons and things like that. Okay? Because in the everyday world, you know, of course, thing, physical quantities have values. Okay? And they, they have values. It doesn't depend whether you measure them or not. They have values. They're saying that in the quantum world, it's completely different. Things just don't have values until you measure them. And so Bohr even went so far as to say that the, that the nature of the quantum world is and will forever be unknowable. Okay? We, shouldn't, we should just not even try to understand what's going on down there. Just worry about the things that we can know, like what, what happens when we do a measurement. What results might we get. Okay, so pretty radical idea um, to come up all on the basis of this mathematical theory. And not surprisingly, not all physicists were happy with this idea. And in fact, the most famous physicist of the 20th century, Albert Einstein, was not happy with this idea. Okay. So he wrote, along with a couple of his colleagues, uh, in 1935, a very famous paper <laughs> criticizing the Copenhagen interpretation from Bohr. Okay. And so here he is uh, explaining what, what he, he doesn't like. Uh, I can't accept the way measurements create reality in your interpretation, Bohr. The whole idea of measurement is vague. And so this, in the different font, which you can see, is actually a real quote from Einstein. It says, will a sidelong glance by a mouse suffice? Okay. Is that enough to be a measurement? You know, you talk about measurement, what do you mean? You know, does it, it has to be a human making the measurement? Uh, does it, could it be, uh, did, does it have to be a professor? Could, would an undergrad work? Um, what about a mouse? You know, does the mouse have to look directly? Could it just be glancing? No. Okay, it's all very vague. Okay, so they, this physics shouldn't be vague. That's what Einstein thought. Physical quantities must have values prior to measurement. We don't want to introduce this idea of measurement into physics, Einstein thought. A proper interpretation must have hidden variables, okay? Things which we can't directly see, but which will uh, give values, determine the values that we get when we make measurements. Okay? And so Einstein was saying that if we in come up with a better theory with hidden variables, it will ensure that physical quantities have values even when we're not measuring them, even before we measure them. And moreover, it will remove action at the distance. Okay, what's he going on about action at the distance? Well, you'd have to read the details of, of his paper, but at the, I'm going to actually give uh, uh, Schrodinger, who's another famous physicist from around this time, uh, give him a chance to describe that because he also wrote a paper in 1935, criticizing uh, Bohr, um, and gave the same sort of argument that, that, that Einstein and his colleagues did. So I'll let him say, so the action in the distance, which Einstein is worried about, which seems to be in this theory, comes about when we have two particles which have interacted and become entangled. So this is a crucial word which Schrodinger introduced in 1935 to describe something which exists in quantum theory but not in the everyday world, this idea of entangled particles or entanglement. Okay? So what it has to do with action at distance is because when you have entangled particles, when one particle is measured, okay, so, we, so Bohr and Heisberg said, you know, when you measure a particle that creates the reality of a physical quantity for that particle, the problem is when you have entangled particles that they they've interacted but have separated, then the result not only causes the reality to appear for the particle you're measuring, it causes an instantaneous change in the other particle, no matter how far away it is, because it creates a reality for that particle as well. So this was a, a feature of the interpretation of Bohr and Heisenberg that, that Schrodinger and Einstein and others like them really didn't like. Okay, so you, you might think, well, so there was this huge disagreement in physics in the 1930s and, and you know, that must have dominated things uh, uh, after that. But what actually happened is that, you know, other things got in the way, like the war, the Second World War, worrying about calculating all sorts of things that could be calculated. And physicists actually, for a whole generation, more or less forgot about this argument. Okay? They forgot about thinking about whether Einstein was right or Bohr was right. Most of them probably thought Bohr was right. 
uh, and they just they just got on with the, 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 the you know what they were being paid for, which was to calculate things. Okay, but but there were a few physicists who weren't like that. A few of them kept worrying about this, and in particular, uh, one who who did some the absolutely crucial work in this and should be much better known, but isn't, is uh, John Bell. So he was a, a physicist from Belfast in Ireland. Uh, and he, in 1964, he published a crucial paper. And I'll let him again say what he found. So he's saying, I've proven a theorem that showing that Einstein was wrong. Okay? Very, not many people have done that. Okay. Proving that his idea that hidden variables can remove the action of the distance in quantum mechanics, in the Copenhagen interpretation, cannot work. Okay? That you could add hidden variables, but they will not remove the action of the distance in the Copenhagen interpretation. So to be specific, what he proved was that when you have quantum entanglement, that, that <coughs> idea that Schrodinger introduced, and, well, and that Einstein had previously talked about without, without those words, uh, the theory predicts correlations between distant measurement results that cannot be explained without non-locality. Okay? So, crucial word, cannot be explained, so we're talking about explaining these correlations, and non-locality in the sense of instantaneous transfer of information across a distance. Okay? So, if you want to explain where measurement results come from, if you want to have these hidden variables that do that, then you can't get away from having uh, this instantaneous transfer of information. <coughs> okay, so, so Bell, you might think, because he proved Einstein was wrong, that he was on Bohr's side, but that wasn't the case at all. Okay? He actually was, was like Einstein and Schrodinger. He was very concerned about this whole um, Copenhagen interpretation and this non-locality, and he found this whole thing very unsettling and really wondered, can nature really be so strange? Can it, can it really be the case that these correlations exist, which imply that I can't explain them without having transfer of information uh, instantaneously across a distance? So once um, Bell's paper was published, uh, it took a while for physicists to notice it. Okay, They weren't used to thinking about this. But uh, gradually, a few got interested, and then more and more got interested. <coughs> Uh, and they started doing experiments. So the first experiment started uh, in 1973, and then they continued for decades after that, um, until, well, so I'm saying, of course, they're still going on today. People still do these experiments. But I'm putting a stop at 2015, because that was where some really crucial experiments got done. Okay, So it's, uh, uh, it, we're living in a pretty exciting time. You might wonder, like, if they did one experiment, why do they need to do more than one experiment? Well, it's because there are... There are careful ways of doing an experiment, and there are more careful ways, and then even more careful ways. And, and basically, we physicists have been getting more and more careful and doing it more and more rigorously over the years, until now pretty much everyone agrees that what was achieved in 2015 was the, the pinnacle, and we, um, we can pretty much say that we've, we know the answer to this question of whether nature is so, so weird. Okay? Do these correlations that can't be explained except by instantaneous transfer information do they exist? Uh, and so one of the experimentalists who um, worked on this, she's the first, there were th actually three experimental papers published in 2015 on this. Uh, Marissa Justina, who was the first author on one of those at the University of Vienna. I'm sure you're wondering, right, so what is the result? I've been putting it off. They, these experiments have been going on for decades, and finally we've got the answer. Is quantum mechanics really so crazy, or is it possible that quantum mechanics is actually wrong? Okay, all that, that beautiful theory that's been developed, and as Bell thought it might be, actually be wrong. What's the answer? Okay, well, we're going <laughs> to we'll get there eventually. All right, let, let, let Marissa explain. We have created pairs of entangled photons and sent them to two labs more than 50 meters apart. So this literally is a picture of one of the labs, and down the end of that corridor there is the picture of the other lab. Okay, so this is really where the experiment was done. There we have performed, at precisely the same time, measurements of their polarization. Okay, that's just um, one of the properties of, of a photon. Like the spin of an electron, it has only two possible values. So it's a nice, clean, experiment, experimental thing, property to measure. Okay, what do the results show? They show the type of correlations John Bell used in his non-locality theorem and are exactly as quantum mechanics predicts. 